podcast. Highlights from the August 13th edition of Q, the program. Plus the curious history of Father Yode and his California commune. May the source be with you. This is Q. Which includes a utopian spiritual community, a guru with 14 wives, and an organic restaurant frequented by John Lennon and Jethro Tull. And these five ingredients come together in a non-fiction book called The Source, the untold story of Father Yod, Yehoah 13, and the Source family. It takes place mostly in a Hollywood Hills mansion during the late 1960s, home to the commune of Father Yod, his wives, and the hundred people who were part of their spiritual tribe. Jody Willey edited the story of this remarkable 60s experiment, and I spoke to her from her own literary compound in Washington State when the book came out in the spring. I began by asking her how she first came across the story of Father Yod. I first heard of it through a friend of mine who showed me this um, elaborate Japanese 13 CD box set in the late 90s. It was beautiful. I looked at it, and I saw the images of the group, and I was just astounded that they had um, operated, they flourished in Los Angeles in the 60s and 70s, and I'd never heard of them. So I searched all over for um, information. There wasn't any on the Internet. But then about five years later, my husband was at a record store looking through the classical CD section, and just laying right on top of that section out of place was this student film <laughs> that somebody had created on the Source family with actual interviews with family members. And he said, oh, I bet Jody would like this. And he brought it home, and, and I just said, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you found this. And uh, I've been looking for information on them. We watched it, and I was kind of astounded by how charming and intelligent and independent all of the family members who were interviewed sounded. They sounded like they'd actually be fun people to just hang out with and talk to. Really interesting. So I thought that it would be an incredible book and uh, looked them up on the Internet. And Isis Aquarian wrote me back right away when I found their site and said, oh, it's so funny that you wrote me just now. My source family brother, Electricity, and I have been working on this book for seven years, and we just finished it. So we started on the book. But, you know, strange things happen. Like um, when Isis was at our compound in Los Angeles, you know, we live in this sort of fantasy-style compound, and I was showing her the houses, and I said, oh, that actor, Bud Court, you know, who played in Harold and Maude and the, the, the Life Aquatic, uh, lives in this house right here, and she looked at me, and she said, Bud Court was in the Source family. Really? And it, yeah, it just happened that the most, you know, famous member of the Source family who almost went to Hawaii with them uh, was our next-door neighbor. And then, wow. and then when I was looking, uh, my husband, Adam, was looking through the manuscripts that I worked on with Isis. He said, Bart Baker, Bart Baker, how do I know that name? And Bart Baker was one of Father Yo's sons when he was still named Jim Baker, you know, right when he was this sort of hipster restaurateur. And he looked at me and he said, Jody, I think Father Yo's son is our car insurance broker. And it is? <laughs> yeah. Oh and it turned God. out that Father Yod's son has been insuring my husband's car for like the last 20 years. Well, I'm sure Jim Baker's not the most, you know, there's probably a few of them floating around. Well, but no, I can't we believe researched it. It's and him. it's the same one. That's, it is him. That Father is a Yod's convergence son. of coincidences that i the most of which I've never heard. Well, okay, so you can tell me a little bit about Father Yod as a character, because before he was a leader, he was this guy, Jim Baker, just a guy. So trace the metamorphosis to this Father Yod. Well, I have to say, he wasn't quite just a guy. He was always this kind of legendary figure uh, ever since he was younger. He, he grew up in Cincinnati. He was a war hero who shot down 16 Japanese planes as his uh, the ship was sinking in World War II. He became a judo wrestling champion. He was an archery champion in high school. And he came out to Los Angeles because he came out to audition for the role of Tarzan. And he didn't get the role. But he, he was not love. just a guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not quite just a guy. Um, he, he fell in love with this gorgeous woman named Elaine Baker, and they started the Aware In restaurant, which was arguably the first organic gourmet restaurant in the United States. And Greta Garbo was his first customer, and he promptly had an affair with her. And uh, he was like a total ladies' man. And uh, just like a sort of a notorious very successful hipster restaurateur. He had another restaurant called The Old World, and all the movie stars went there. Marlon Brando, you know, uh, Steve Allen, Julie Christie, just, just everybody you can imagine went to his restaurant. So when the source opened, you know, all of these famous people already knew who he was, and there was a lot of anticipation for it. And that was, you know, where all of the rock stars really came in and, and visited. So, I mean, if you just went to the source family on, on any ordinary day, you, you'd probably see 
you know, between three and four people that you noticed from, you know, the wow. pop charts or movie stars. Yeah, it was really a hub. It's so crazy to think of this, this guy, Father Yo, to, to see a picture of him. He looks like a cross between Santa and Jesus or something. You know, he's got the yeah, big white really beard and, and, and yet he's with women. He just draws women in. You know, he obviously had something. <laughs> I mean, well, well, before he grew his beard out, he kind of looked like an older Steve McQueen. I mean, he's a, he's a pretty handsome dude. Mm. But but I think that what happened, I should mention, when he was uh, doing the source restaurant, he became a student of Yogi Bhajan, who was this very popular Sikh guru. You know, gurus were all the rage at this time in the late 60s and early 70s, and it was just like an L.A. cliche for someone to run off and go find themselves. And so that happened to him. He got swept up in the currents of the time, really the right hand of Yogi Bhajan. And Yogi took him to um, India to meet his guru and get his blessing to have Jim Baker take over the ashram in L.A. And what happened was he had a realization there where he, he didn't want to be Yogi Bhajan's follower. He thought he should he should be his own person, and he threw his headdress into the Ganges and, uh, and decided to host his own meditations in L.A. And when he did, he came back, and there was just this instant following. So he was a very charismatic and funny. People in the Source family, I've interviewed about 20 of them for the book. You know, I, expand, I helped ISIS expand the book. Mm -hmm. And um, interviewing all of these former family members, even to this day, they all have this reverence and just deep love for him. Like, he was, he was really a loving, funny... And, and just outrageous guy. Well, he definitely yeah. took that whole thing and formed this crazy cult. Now, you've mentioned ISIS a couple times, so I want to give our listeners a bit of context. He was, she was one of the uh, spiritual wives of Father Yod, one of the 14. ISIS was one of his, yeah, 14 spiritual wives. She was also named Keeper of the Records and Family Historian, and so she assembled these massive scrapbooks and took a lot of photographs and shot movies and, and a lot of that we used in the book. We have over 100 images. We have actually, I think, close to 200 images from their family archive in the book, which are pretty astounding. And she, she did a really good job. Oh, yeah, <laughs> she did. Yeah, and, and Isis, you know, she was a former fashion model and was dating, you know, heirs to, you know, the Smirnoff Vodka fortune and, and was living with one of the biggest rock and roll photographers of the 60s when she just dropped everything, left it behind for Father Yod. Jody, I'm going to, uh, I actually spoke to Isis earlier, and I want to play a clip of her describing the moment that she met him and realized that he was going to change her whole life. As soon as I walked into the store and saw him, I knew that that was, that was my thread. And it was very easy to walk out on something that was no longer working for me anyhow. And I had known it, it felt like most of my life, I felt like I was just, walking through my life waiting for something. I really never felt like I fit anywhere. All of a sudden I fit and I was home and uh, I just said, oh my God, you know, and he said, well, welcome back. And that was it. So Jody, you spoke with many of the women who were his spiritual wives. Were they all as positive as Isis was regarding his role? You know, it's really strange, but all of them except for one were, and they all said that about something like having this very deep magnetic pull to the family and to, to Father Yod. There was one woman who's in the book, and she, uh, she felt like she had been taken advantage of, which is more of the typical sort of guru story, mm -hmm. you know, because a lot of um, gurus back in the 60s, they never pretended to be saints, you know. They, they, they were these kind of wild holy men who were initiating their followers into these mysteries of the universe. But many of them had a lot of women. Yogi Bhajan had so many, but he kept them all under the table. He hid them. And I think that was really hard for a lot of the women. What was interesting about Father Yogi was instead of hiding the women he was um, sexually involved with, he sort of raised them up within the family and made them into the council that led the family and, um, and sort of honored them. And so I think that might have to do with the reason why a lot of the women still love him and thank him, because he really honored them. And they're... There was just one woman. There might be another. I didn't interview all 14, but I think I interviewed about nine. And they were all really positive. They were all positive, Other except for one who still loved him and thought he was a great teacher, but thought that he took advantage of her at a young age, that, you know, he was kind of chasing after her. Well, you've so. observed this so closely, Jody. What do you say to people who call it a cult? Um, you know, it's funny because I asked people in the, the group, did you feel like you were brainwashed? And um, one of the members, uh, this guy Orbit, who runs one of the most, you know, one of the biggest car dealerships in the country right now. I mean, um, so many of them got, have gone on to successful careers. It's interesting. And he said, 
Of course we were brainwashed. She said that was exactly what I needed back then. That was exactly what we all needed. You know, we'd all grown up in this in this world full of materialism and hypocrisy, and we needed a new start. And, and so it's really interesting. I think that there were cultish aspects um, of the Source family, definitely. But I think that since Father Yoga was a benign leader, they weren't anything close to uh, what most people normally perceive as cults or cult leaders. You know, you know we're brought up on images of Jonestown and the Manson family, mm -hmm. and, and the mass media shows us that cults are evil and bad. And what I found through, through, through this um, project, and I really didn't know this beforehand because I have my own prejudices, what I found is that we have a history in America and in Canada as well as of these spiritual utopian you know, communities who are basically benign people with benign, relatively benign leaders. And what happens is they never do anything bad. And so they just, they don't get hurt by the press or they disappear. You know, they just disappear into history over the years. And, and a lot of these groups have provided very meaningful experiences for the members. They, they find the family that they've been speak, you know, seeking. Mm -hmm. They find this community of people who support them. And, uh, and so I have to say I earned a new respect for utopian communities and um, alternative spiritual communities that sometimes get a really bad rap and then sometimes are just forgotten. It was pretty astounding to me and uh, made me sort of see that whole thing differently. Well, that being said, with all the stories that are coming out nowadays with polygamous communities and maybe not as humanistic as Father Yod, but still, do you see that situation, the kind of thing that happened in the 60s, existing today? I want to just uh, clarify one thing, too. You know, Father Yod seemed hedonistic in some ways, but the family was very, very disciplined in mm -hmm. what they did. And everything they did, you know, they said that they took sex, drugs, and rock and roll and infused it with spirit and transformed them all into positive enlightenment. So they took all these crazy things that young people were doing in the 60s, smoking lots of pot, having lots of sex, doing lots of drugs, or, you know, and, and they, they just were very limited in their marijuana. They called it the sacred herb. And, and they only, you know, they, they claimed to have sexual relations for enlightenment. It was kind of tantra, kundalini yoga. But anyway, I think that what's happening today with the Mormons is another example of one of those leaders who, I think it's very easy for leaders who have who are in positions of power to get corrupted. And I think that clearly, you know, Warren Jeffs, and, uh, and that sort of world is in a very abusive and repressive world for the women involved. Uh, very different from the Source family where, where women got to choose the men who they were with. It was a completely different situation, even though it looked different. All of those 14 women came to Father Yod, and many of them were just obsessed with him. So it's, it's not what it seems, you know, for that group. And I think others, you know, utopian communities as, as well. There's a community called the Oneidans. I don't know if you've ever noticed you've, you've been eating with Oneida silverware. It's one of the oh, most, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oneida was a cult. Oneida, what, what some people would call a cult. They were a spiritual commune who practiced polyamory, multiple partners. They practiced what, and this was in the 1800s, they were led by this Yale graduate called John Humphrey Noyes, and they practiced what they called male continence, which was the same kind of sexual practice that the Source family had. And the women wore pants. <laughs> they didn't wear robes <laughs> like the Source family did. Pardon me? The Source family were all in robes with long hair. Well, yeah, the Source very... family were much more glamorous than, than, than the Oneidans. The Oneidans. But I, mean, I guess what I'm saying is they had very unconventional dress for the time period, and, and the women were treated as equals. So, you know, really what we have are these utopian groups full of people who see the world that they're in, they're not happy with it. They think that there are unhealthy components, and they're just trying to make a better world. And, and many times they do. The Oneidans ended up having a successful community, and they uh, have this legacy in this business that still works. Amana Ranges, uh, you know, Amana, Amana was also another spiritual community. So, so these groups actually influence our culture in larger levels that many of us are not even aware of. Well, it's not a bad idea. Ways. Not a bad idea to have everything in moderation, I suppose. So it's yeah. just to end yeah. after a while. I mean, the family... The the Source family could never have lasted. You know, it was definitely a wild utopian experiment. But then if you look at the family members today, you know, there's one guy who, he runs this $500 million Ayurve Ayurvedic herb company. Mm -hmm. There's another woman, one of Father Yod's wives, who um, started two successful vegetarian restaurants, and now she serves on a committee that works with United Nations to help so women in their own countries. They've all gone on to different things. But yeah. just to end off, what happened to Father Yod? Father Yo died in this kind of spectacular hang gliding accident in the 70s, in the mid-70s. Wow. And I think, I think what happened was, you know, the family had, after they left Los Angeles, he kind of had these apocalyptic visions that there was going to be nuclear war in the mainland. 
They flew to Hawaii. The Hawaiians thought they were the Manson family. They just did not understand them, you know, and uh, and and they had a hard time being accepted. And things kind of went downhill from there. And I think, you know, Father Yo kept telling everybody in the family, "Listen, I've taught you everything. I can teach you. Go out and you're on your own now. It's time for you to leave." <laughs> and people couldn't leave. And I don't know. I, I think that I think that the pressures were really mounting. And one day he just decided he was going to try hang gliding for the first time. And I and, think uh, he just decided whatever would happen would be fate. And he actually flew off the highest cliff in, in Oahu, and he made it. He had a 10-minute flight with no instructions ever and a, a hang gliding thing that was too small for him. But he <laughs> crash-landed and died after nine hours. Well, as, he, as he said, that was his, uh, it was going to be the end. It was going to be the end. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank yeah. you so much, Joey. I really appreciate you taking the time to stop and talk to us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me, and uh, I hope you have a lovely day. That was Jody Willey, publisher and editor of The Source, the untold story of Father Yod, Yehoah 13, and The Source family. It's published by Process Media. Jody was in Washington State.